Even today, a scene like this seems almost unbelievable. A man floating in space while way below the world spins past. The trail of technology that allows us to experience such an amazing feat has its roots deeply embedded in the X-Plane series. By the end of the 50s, spaceflight was becoming a reality, and the Boeing X-20 concept seemed like the direction it was all heading. Powerful multi-stage rockets would boost the X-20 into orbit. Re-entry and landing would be by unpowered glide. During World War II, German researchers proposed a bomber using this boost glide system. It would skip across the upper atmosphere at 13,000 miles per hour. The X-20's proposed use of this dynamic soaring gave it a foreboding name, the dinosaur. In 1961, research was well underway. Thermal experiments were essential. The dinosaur would need to withstand incredible extremes of heat and cold. Technology was at its limits as researchers simulated speeds nearing 17,000 miles per hour. Although scheduled for flight in 1965, the dinosaur, like its namesake, was headed for extinction. A program that promised a pilotable, reusable spacecraft almost 20 years before the shuttle was canceled in 1963. The U.S. was taking the most expedient way to reach space. Expendable rockets and space capsules were a faster answer to the Soviets' early space race lead. The X-20's slower development and high cost couldn't compete with the quick and easy capsule method. As the space race drew closer to putting a man on the moon, researchers still worked at perfecting shapes that could conceivably fly to space and back. Launched from a helicopter, the Hyper-3 was a half-scaled glider. Built to test ideas a generation beyond the ill-fated dinosaur, it was piloted remotely from a ground-based simulated cockpit. The Hyper-3's specially shaped body provided all its lift. Small, straight, retractable winglets allowed lower speed landings. This lifting body configuration was projected as the shape of the space plane of the future. In the late 60s, the Martin Marietta X-24A, along with other lifting body aircraft, helped develop many aspects of flight without wings including safe, steep approach landing methods crucial to the success of this kind of aircraft. In June 1971, the X-24A was retired, but researchers were still eager to investigate other configurations. As the glamorous Apollo missions drained cash flow, budgets were tight, so plans were drawn up to glove the existing airframe with a dramatically different shape. Jerry Gentry flew the X-24A for the Air Force. In essence, I just changed the bottom of it uh, from uh, essentially an oval shape and made it into a very slender uh, uh, delta. And so they were able, at minimal expense, to, to look at two different configurations uh, rather inexpensively. The idea was to retain the existing and already proven systems of the old aircraft and fit a brand new body around it the flying potato would be transformed into a sleek flying dagger. The new shape was a blended body and wing, aesthetically far removed from its previous form. Stunningly transformed, the new X-24B rolled out of Martin Marietta's Denver facility on October 11, 1972. Ten months after the A-model shell was delivered. Extensively modified, it had grown 15 feet longer. Its flat iron shape, exhaustively tested in wind tunnels, promised excellent handling qualities. It certainly looked like the shape of the future.
The X-24B was designed to be air-launched. Modified B-52 bombers used for the X-15 were pressed into service. As a cost-cutting measure, the X-15 mounting pylon was modified with an adapter for the X-24. NASA test pilot John Mankey had flown the X-24A. On November 15, 1973, he would become the first to fly the new configuration under power. His observations would prove invaluable in comparing the two shapes' performance and handling qualities. The rocket power plant was the same trusty XLR-11 type that had pushed the X-1 through the sound barrier 26 years before. The handling qualities of the X-24B were very much to the pilot's liking. The double delta shape gave two times the lift and three times the maneuverability of the old configuration. The feel was more like a fighter, more responsive and flyable than the pure lifting body of the X-24A. The X-24B's most striking feature, its long pointed nose, was designed for a very good reason. It was found that the rounded stubby nose of the earlier form, although desirable to combat re-entry heating, was a handicap at lower speeds. With its sharp triangular form, the B model allowed much better handling and stability during its steep landing approach. By August 1975, the Space Shuttle project was well underway, drawing many ideas from the X-24B. The huge, flat, dry lake runways at Edwards were invaluable, but the shuttle needed verification that the proposed steep, power-off landing method could be accomplished on a conventional runway. The X-24B showed that it could make accurate and safe landings on concrete. NASA pilot Bill Dana flew most of the lifting bodies and was a veteran of the pioneering X-15 project that had taken man higher and faster than any winged aircraft. He found the X-24B different in many ways, but familiar in others. It was a very benign flight uh, compared to an X-15 flight, but the approach and landing were identical in the two airplanes. A, a steep power off landing with the landing gear coming down very late in the, uh, in the flight. And in, in that aspect, why the X-24 was very similar to the X-15. Dana's first X-24B flight had taken place early in September 1975. The little craft had easily pushed up to Mach 1.5 and reached 71,000 feet. By that time, the 24B had already proved itself a much greater performer than the X-24A. In May 1975, John Mankey had taken the X-24B to its highest altitude of 74,130 feet. The previous year, U.S. Air Force pilot Colonel Michael Love had clocked the speed of Mach 1.76, or 1,163 miles per hour. Bill Dana's second flight was the X-24B's final powered flight. As the XLR-11 rocket engine shut down, Dana had just pushed the little bird into supersonic flight. At a conservative altitude of around 57,000 feet, he prepared for the fast glide down with the familiar steep landing approach. This method of landing had proved very efficient and accurate. The pilot almost had only to point the aircraft at the spot where he wanted to touch down on. When activated, the X-24B's rugged landing gear snapped out amazingly fast. The pilot would wait for the last possible moment to drop the gear, as the drag caused loss of precious speed, lift and control. Power off landings left no second chances. I think the major contribution of the uh, lifting bodies to technology to date has been the 
demonstration that a variety of uh, various shapes could be landed uh, power off even though they had steep uh, final approach glides. The X-24B's final powered flight in September 1975 also marked the final rocket flight of the X-plane series. Ironically, it operated with the same type of engine used on the first X-plane. The Martin Marietta X-24B is now on display at the United States Air Force Museum in Dayton, Ohio. The most advanced of the lifting bodies retired as the space shuttle was being ready for its debut. The evolutionary trail towards the shuttle was completed by this truly unique aircraft. The original space shuttle uh, intended to uh, carry four or five jet engines and extend them after re-entry, uh, light them up, and then make a power on landing. And uh, through our uh, experiences uh, with the lifting bodies and our ability to successfully land, uh, power off a number of different shapes, uh, we convinced uh, NASA Houston uh, to remove the uh, landing engines and the jet fuel from the space shuttle. This reduced the uh, uh, orbital weight uh, of the uh, shuttle 35,000 pounds and reduce the launch weight by a million pounds. The orbiting shuttle is in some way the realization of the X-20 dinosaur. Boosted into orbit like the Apollo capsules by jettisoned rockets, the shuttle is a pilotable, reusable system. Thanks to the invaluable data provided by the lifting bodies, it can make a controlled gliding re-entry and descend to a safe pinpoint landing anywhere on Earth. However, the lifting bodies may still have a lot to offer the next step beyond the shuttle. The future of the X-Planes looks exhilarating. These computer images are of the shockwave pattern around the X-30, the proposed NASP or National Aerospace Plane. Designers use supercomputers to provide data that wind tunnels can't give us. This part airplane, part spaceship will need to fly over 17,000 miles per hour and survive the tremendous heat loads of accelerating into orbit and re-entry. New materials with greater heat resistance, lighter weight, and greater strength will also need to survive the extremes of ultra-cold. New alloys and carbon fabrication technologies will be stretched to the limits. With all this information from simulation and supercomputers, we know pretty much what to expect, so why should we build the X-30? Scott Crossfield, X-Plane test pilot and aerodynamicist. If you could do things with unmanned systems, with computers, you might just calculate what you want to do and then not bother to build the system. This is a human experience, this thing of being on Earth. The uh, Russians saw the backside of the moon first, but we had a man on there first. And, and the, the strides that we took in the technology of understanding the moon are, are orders of magnitude more than they learned just by flying around the backside of it. Huh? Or with the unmanned systems that land on the moon. That's one. NASA and the Department of Defense have been exploring hypersonic technologies for years. Each X-plane can almost be seen as a building block of knowledge working towards the X-30. The National Aerospace Plane will be a single stage to orbit space vehicle, able to take off under its own power and fly into orbit around the Earth. After completing its space mission, the X-30, like the shuttle, will make a long, unpowered gliding descent, re-enter the atmosphere and land on a conventional runway. Jay Miller, aviation historian. 
In fact, the NASP is point A. It is a research tool, it is an exploratory tool, it is, a, uh, it is hardware that will allow us to prove whether or not we can build a vehicle that will basically be single stage to orbit. DX-30's flight tests will be in carefully monitored increments, adding speed a little at a time. Computers will use this data to stay ahead of the game, searching for hot spots on the X-30's skin that if not discovered could eat up the plane during hypersonic flight. Many of the lessons learned from the X-15 and lifting body programs about aerodynamic heating, shock wave patterns, and countless other subjects form the huge database that researchers refer to. The National Aerospace Plane Project stands on the shoulders of its pioneering X-plane predecessors. After many years, they continue to yield priceless information, even of a more down-to-earth nature. There's no question that the National Aerospace Plane will use techniques developed to land the X-15 and to land the lifting bodies uh, when they're learning how to set up their approach pattern for the uh, X-30. Originally conceived as a Concorde-like sleek space shuttle, now as the X-30 takes shape, it seems to be a much more radical design. Maybe the lifting body has found its time. Jerry Gentry, lifting body test pilot. The lifting body uh, uh, program, people lost obvious interest in that uh, when uh, the decision was made on the space shuttle configuration. A uh, great many people thought at, at one time or another that the lifting body would probably be the configuration for the space shuttle. What's interesting is to see now what the configuration is for the National Aerospace Plane, or X-30. And indeed, it is a lifting body again. So the lifting body is starting to, to return to vogue or popularity. The affirmation of the lifting body shows how so much high technology research is a matter of planting the seed of an idea and many years later seeing it bear fruit. Such a huge project could never be attempted by one company. The National Aerospace Plane will involve five major aerospace companies in a huge consortium effort controlled by NASA and the Department of Defense. The difficulty lies that when you're trying to build a single stage to orbit vehicle, you're looking at a very expensive platform, particularly when you're talking about a limited production vehicle. I mean, they're not going to build but maybe two or three of these aircraft. And they are strictly research vehicles to prove certain points, to achieve certain performance objectives. But the scramjet power plant has yet to be invented. Just to start one up would be like lighting a match in a hurricane. The scramjet is kind of the next generation, if you will, of propulsion systems. It is kind of the ultimate jet engine. Like all X-planes, the X-30 will tackle seemingly insurmountable problems and open new doors. Scott Crossfield, involved with X-planes from the X-1 to the X-15 and now the X-30, is still a great believer in the research airplane. I'm determined we're going to catch up with where we left off on the X-15 with the National Aerospace Space Plan. The limitations being largely economic. It's not technical. We know more about the National Aerospace Space Plan today than we did at the Apollo, the X-15, the Mercury at this stage. So that's my, my thesis. And uh, the, it's a natural extension of what's proven successful, the research airplane program. The promise of the X-30 National Aerospace Plane is viewed as the ultimate X-Plane. The payoff will be just like the other projects. New ways of flying, building, and powering the next generation of flying machines. The dreams that were stirred in the heady days after World War II as the X-1 flew into supersonic flight for the first time are still alive. But there can be no ultimate X-plane, as there will always be another goal to reach, another door to open, 
and another X-plane to fly into the unknown. From 1963 to 1975, a fleet of lifting bodies operated at NASA's Flight Research Center, now Armstrong Flight Research Center in Edwards, California, showcased the capability of pilots to maneuver and safely land a wingless vehicle. These lifting bodies were specifically designed to validate the concept of returning a wingless vehicle from space and executing an aircraft-like landing at a predetermined site. These pioneering research vehicles, distinguished by their unconventional aerodynamic shapes, included the M2F1, M2F2, M2F3, HL10, X24A and the X24B. The data gathered from the lifting body program significantly contributed to the knowledge base that ultimately facilitated the development of the Space Shuttle program. Unlike conventional aircraft that rely on wings for aerodynamic lift, these lifting bodies derive lift from their unique shapes. Fins and control surfaces were added to enable pilots to stabilize and maneuver the vehicles, effectively controlling their flight paths. With the exception of the M2F1, all of these vehicles were powered by the XLR11 rocket engine, the same type used in the Bell X1, which famously achieved supersonic flight, breaking the sound barrier for the first time. The M2F1, serving as a lightweight prototype, was unpowered. The original idea of lifting bodies was conceived around 1957 by Dr. Alfred J. Eggers Jr., then the Assistant Director for Research and Development Analysis and Planning at the Ames Aeronautical Laboratory, now NASA's Ames Research Center in California's Silicon Valley. H. Julian Allen, an engineer at Ames Research Center, concluded that a blunt nose cone shape was optimal for surviving the intense aerodynamic heating encountered during re-entry from space. The collective research efforts of Eggers, Allen and their team culminated in the design of the M2, a modified half cone shape characterized by a rounded bottom and a flat top featuring a blunt, rounded nose and twin tail fins. This innovative configuration, along with subsequent lifting bodies, enabled them to be maneuvered both laterally and longitudinally, facilitating landings on runways rather than relying on ocean splashdowns typical of contemporary ballistic capsules used in programs like Mercury, Gemini and Apollo. In 1962, Flight Research Center Director Paul Bickel greenlit a program aimed at constructing a lightweight, unpowered lifting body to serve as a prototype for testing the wingless concept. Resembling a flying bathtub, this prototype was designated the M2F1. Crafted by sailplane designer Gus Briegleb, the M2F1 featured a plywood shell enveloping a tubular steel frame meticulously assembled at the center. Construction reached completion in 1963. The initial flight trials involved towing the M2F1 aloft using a souped-up Pontiac convertible, reaching speeds of up to 120 miles per hour across Rogers Dry Lake. These early tests yielded sufficient flight data about the M2F1, paving the way for subsequent flights behind a NASA R4D towplane at higher altitudes. The R-4D, a Navy designation for the C-47 or civilian DC-3 aircraft, towed the craft to an altitude of 12,000 feet, where it was then released to soar freely back to Rogers Dry Lake, marking a significant milestone in the experimental journey of the M2F-1 lifting body. NASA research pilot Milt Thompson flew the M2F-1 during the first series of tests. During typical glide flights with the M2F1, the aircraft would remain airborne for several minutes, cruising at speeds ranging from 110 to 120 miles per hour. Remarkably, the M2F1 underwent over 400 ground tows and 77 aircraft tow flights before being retired from active service. Today, this significant historical artifact is under the ownership of the Smithsonian's National Air and Space Museum. Currently, it's on a long-term loan to NASA Armstrong, where it has undergone meticulous restoration to resemble its flight-worthy condition, allowing future generations to appreciate its pioneering contributions to aerospace research and development. The success achieved through the M2F1 program spurred NASA to embark on the development and construction of two heavyweight lifting bodies, drawing from studies conducted at NASA's Ames and Langley Research Centers. 
These lifting bodies were the M2F2 and the HL10, both of which were manufactured by Northrop Corporation. In the nomenclature, the M denotes manned, while the F signifies flight. The HL designation originates from horizontal landing, with the number 10 indicating the 10th lifting body design explored by Langley. Subsequently, the US Air Force also expressed interest in lifting body research, leading to the creation of a third design concept known as the X-24A, fabricated by the Martin Company. This model underwent modifications to become the X-24B, with both configurations actively participating in the joint NASA Air Force lifting body program at the Flight Research Center. The fundamental flight profile of these heavyweight lifting bodies involved air launching from NASA's modified NB-52B mothership at an altitude of approximately 45,000 feet, marking the commencement of their experimental flight missions. The XLR-11 rocket engine was then ignited and the vehicle accelerated to speeds of up to 1,100 miles per hour and to altitudes of 60,000 to 70,000 feet. After the rocket engine was shut down, the pilots began steep glides towards the Edwards runway. As the pilots initiated the final approach leg, they augmented their rate of descent to accelerate and harness momentum, executing a flare-out maneuver to decelerate their landing speed to approximately 200 miles per hour, mirroring the basic approach pattern and landing speed utilized by today's space shuttles. The inaugural flight of the M2F2, which closely resembled the M2F1, took place on July 12, 1966, with Milt Thompson once again at the controls. By this time, the same B-52 aircraft responsible for air launching the renowned X-15 rocket research craft had been adapted to also accommodate the lifting bodies. The M2F2 was released from the B-52's wing pylon mount at an altitude of 45,000 feet during its maiden glide flight. The M2F2, weighing in at 4,620 pounds without ballast, measured approximately 22 feet in length and boasted a width of about 10 feet. Tragically, on May 10, 1967, during the 16th glide flight, a landing mishap resulted in severe damage to the vehicle and inflicted serious injuries upon the NASA pilot Bruce Peterson. NASA pilots identified lateral control issues as a contributing factor to the crash of the M2F2, despite the presence of a stability augmentation control system. Subsequently, when the M2F2 underwent reconstruction and was rebranded as the M2F3, enhancements were made to rectify these concerns. One notable modification included the addition of a third vertical fin, strategically positioned between the tip fins to enhance control characteristics. The maiden flight of the revamped M2F3 occurred on June 2, 1970, with NASA pilot Bill Danner at the helm. This initial flight was a glide test aimed at assessing the performance changes resulting from the modifications. Notably, the modified vehicle demonstrated significantly improved lateral stability and control attributes compared to its predecessor, the M2F2. Over the course of the subsequent 26 missions, the M2F3 achieved remarkable milestones. It reached a top speed of 1,064 miles per hour, equivalent to Mach 1.6, with Dana piloting a high-speed mission on December 13, 1972. On December 20, 1972, during its final flight with NASA pilot John Mank in command, the M2F3 attained its highest altitude of 71,500 feet before concluding its operational tenure. Today, the M2F3 stands proudly on display at the National Air and Space Museum in Washington, serving as a testament to its pivotal role in aerospace history and its contributions to the advancement of flight technology. The HL-10, delivered to the Flight Research Center by Northrop in January 1966, took to the skies for its maiden flight approximately 11 months later, on December 22 of the same year, piloted by Bruce Peterson prior to his injury in the M2F2 accident. Over the course of his operational tenure, the HL-10 completed 37 flights, setting numerous program records along the way. Peter Hoag piloted the HL-10 to a remarkable speed of 1,228 miles per hour, equivalent to Mach 1.86, marking the fastest speed achieved by any of the lifting bodies. 
Just nine days later, NASA's Bill Danner guided the HL-10 to an impressive altitude of 90,303 feet, establishing the highest altitude reached by any of the lifting body aircraft. Furthermore, on May 9, 1969, under the command of pilot John Mank, the HL-10 became the first lifting body to achieve supersonic flight. Featuring a longitudinally curved bottom and a laterally rounded top, the HL-10 sported a distinctive Delta platform. In its final configuration, directional control was facilitated by three vertical fins, two of which were cantered outward from the body, accompanied by a tall center fin. A flush canopy blended into the smooth rounded nose. It was about 21 feet long with a span of 13.6 feet. Its glide flight weight was 6,473 pounds and its maximum gross weight was more than 10,000 pounds. The flights of the HL-10 played a significant role in shaping the design decisions for the space shuttles, particularly in the exclusion of air breathing engines for powered landings. The HL-10 concluded its operational flights on July 17, 1970, marking the end of its remarkable journey. Today, this iconic craft stands proudly on public display at the entrance to NASA Armstrong Flight Research Center, serving as a tangible reminder of its invaluable contributions to aerospace research and development. Built for the Air Force by Martin, the X-24A was a bulbous-shaped aircraft with three vertical fins at the rear for directional control. The X-24A boasted a weight of 6,270 pounds without propellants, with dimensions measuring just over 24 feet in length and nearly 14 feet in width. On April 17, 1969, Air Force Major Gerald Gentry piloted the X-24A for its inaugural unpowered glide flight. Gentry also commanded the vehicle during its first powered flight on March 19, 1970. Over the course of its operational lifespan, the X-24A undertook 28 flights, contributing to the validation of the concept that a wingless vehicle could execute unpowered landings akin to the HL-10 program. Decades later, in a cost-saving measure, the X-38 program managers opted to utilize the X-24A design, leveraging its complete aerodynamic database to minimize the need for additional wind tunnel tests that would have been necessary for a completely new design. The X-24A recorded its fastest speed of 1,036 miles per hour, Mach 1.6, with its highest altitude reaching 71,400 feet. Both of these milestones were achieved by NASA research pilot John Mank, who also piloted the craft on its final flight on June 4, 1971. The X-24B's design evolved from a family of potential re-entry shapes proposed by the Air Force Flight Dynamics Laboratory, each with higher lift-to-drag ratios. To reduce the construction costs of a research vehicle, the Air Force opted to return the X-24A to Martin for modifications. These alterations transformed its bulbous shape into a configuration resembling a flying flatiron, featuring a rounded top, flat bottom and a double delta platform culminating in a pointed nose. John Mank took the helm for the maiden flight of the modified X-24B, piloting its first glide flight on August 1, 1973. He also commanded the vehicle during its inaugural powered mission on November 15, 1973. Notably, among the X-24B's final flights were two meticulously executed landings on the main concrete runway at Edwards, showcasing the operational feasibility of precise, unpowered re-entry vehicle landings. These pivotal missions, executed by Mank and Air Force Major Mike Love, played a crucial role in shaping the flight procedures for modern space shuttle landings. The X-24B's last powered flight was on September 23, 1975, with Bill Danner at the controls, marking the conclusion of rocket-powered lifting body flights at the Flight Research Center. Interestingly, Danner also piloted the final X-15 rocket plane mission approximately seven years prior. The X-24B achieved a top speed of 1,164 miles per hour, Mach 1.75, during a flight piloted by Love on October 25, 1974. Its highest altitude reached was 74,100 feet, accomplished by Mank on May 22, 1975. Today, the X-24B stands proudly on public display at the Air Force Museum located at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Ohio, 
serving as a tangible testament to its significant contributions to aerospace research and development. Throughout the 1950s, major aircraft manufacturers in the United States were eagerly exploring the potential of vertical takeoff and landing VTOL technology across various military applications. With the looming threat of intercontinental ballistic missiles and thermonuclear weapons, the military sought VTOL aircraft capable of operating from small dispersed sites without relying on traditional air bases or aircraft carriers, targets that were increasingly vulnerable to attack. A key concept driving this pursuit was the notion that an aircraft with a thrust-to-weight ratio exceeding 1 could vertically launch, transition to horizontal flight for mission execution and then return for a vertical landing. Such capabilities promised to eliminate the need for expensive and easily targeted runways, enhancing the aircraft's survivability and operational flexibility in a rapidly evolving strategic landscape. Among the pioneers in this endeavour was the Ryan Aircraft Corporation, which endeavoured to translate this concept into a practical fighter aircraft for the Air Force with its X-13 Vertijet. However, like most other VTOL aircraft, the performance compromises made for their unique capabilities did not warrant its introduction in place of more capable conventional aircraft. The idea for the Vertijet originated just after World War II, when engineers for Ryan casually debated whether or not their FR-1 Fireball, which had a thrust-to-weight ratio of 1 at low fuel quantities, could take off vertically. The vertical takeoff idea soon advanced beyond the discussion stage. In 1947, the Navy's Bureau of Aeronautics enlisted Ryan for a contract aimed at exploring the technical complexities associated with developing a vertically launched jet fighter, a pivotal aspect of a broader initiative to assess the viability of submarine-based aircraft. Concurrently, the Navy funded a series of experimental tail-sitter aircraft comprising conventionally configured planes outfitted with large counter-rotating propellers designed to rest vertically on reinforced tail sections. Notable examples included the Convair XFY-1 and Lockheed XFV-1, intended to utilise their high thrust propellers for vertical takeoff from various naval vessels, thereby furnishing defensive air cover without the need for aircraft carriers. Ryan's engineering analyses demonstrated the feasibility of a comparable jet-powered design, augmented by a reaction control system capable of redirecting exhaust gases to facilitate control during hovering and low-speed flight. Subsequently, a Navy contract facilitated the construction of an unmanned flying prototype, which conducted its inaugural flight on October 20, 1950. This peculiar contraption, affectionately dubbed the Beast in the Backyard, was propelled by an Allison J-33 turbine and employed a ball-mounted nozzle to provide reaction control while hovering. Ryan engineers converted a B-47 fuel tank into a cockpit to allow test pilot Peter Girard to evaluate the testbed suitability as a manned research aircraft, which sat on its tail to take off vertically. On November 24, 1953, Girard made the first manned hovering flight in a jet aircraft with this unusual machine. After Navy funding ran out, the Air Force became interested in Ryan's experiments and in July 1954 issued a contract to the company to construct two VTOL tail sitter demonstrators designated as the X-13 Vertijet. This project, based on the earlier Navy design proposal, was to demonstrate the suitability of easily dispersible VTOL fighters. Under the guidance of Chief Engineer Curtis Bates, the X-13 emerged as a compact, single-engined delta-wing fighter, with its distinctive features being a set of winglets and fixed landing gear, elements that might appear ordinary to the casual observer. Spearheaded by Robert Furman and the Ryan Technical Section, the aircraft was meticulously designed to be transported on a specialised trailer, capable of tilting vertically to facilitate the launch and recovery of the X-13 during vertical takeoffs and landings. In late 1955, Ryan successfully completed the first Vertijet, serial number 541619, and on December 10, Girard piloted its maiden flight. Initially equipped with a fixed tricycle landing gear, the X-13 underwent testing as a conventional aircraft. Furman and his team prioritised exploring the conventional handling characteristics before risking vertical flight testing. 
Following the resolution of oscillation issues through the installation of dampers, engineers affixed a temporary steel tube truss with custering wheels to the rear of the X-13. This modification allowed the aircraft to assume a tail sitting position during vertical flight testing, eliminating the need for the complex launch and recovery procedures associated with the launch trailer. Pete Girard made the first vertical takeoff and landing on May 28, 1956. On the same day, the second X-13 made its first flight. The aircraft was agile and responsive in conventional flight. As the aircraft transitioned to a nose-high attitude to achieve a hover using the thrust from its own engine, a vectorable exhaust nozzle linked to the controls provided a straightforward and efficient means of control. To facilitate the delicate landing process, small bleed air thrusters positioned on the wingtips enabled minor adjustments to the pitch and yaw of the aircraft when necessary. Integrating both conventional and VTOL control systems, a stability augmentation system ensured smooth transitions without requiring abrupt changes to pilot control inputs. During vertical takeoff, the launch procedure involved raising the bed of the launch trailer vertically. This allowed the X-13 to hang from a cable suspended by two arms on the top of the trailer, featuring a partially retractable hook. For vertical operations, flat bumpers replaced each of the main wheels on the fixed landing gear, preventing damage to the fuselage underside if it swung into the trailer bed, thereby facilitating transportation. Subsequently, the pilot would increase throttle until the hook lifted off the launch cable, then manoeuvre away from the trailer and accelerate vertically, smoothly transitioning to conventional flight. However, vertical landings posed greater challenges and were perhaps the most impractical aspect of the VertiJet concept. Its primary drawback, akin to earlier tail sitters, lay in the obstruction of the pilot's vision by the airframe, making it exceedingly difficult to accurately gauge the distance to the ground without external assistance. Although the pilot's seat pivoted 45 degrees towards vertical during landing, the pilot still had to approach the recovery trailer blind, with the underside of the fuselage facing the surface of the trailer. Constant radio communication with a ground observer was essential to talk the X-13 into position during the cumbersome process. A 6-metre, 20-foot long folding pole with marked gradations attached to the top of the recovery trailer gave the pilot a clear indication of the distance remaining before he contacted the trailer. Once in position, the pilot gradually reduced the throttle until the nose hook caught the recovery cable. On May 28, 1956, the X-13 executed its inaugural vertical hovering flight, initiating a series of summer tests where Girard and fellow test pilot Lou Everett practiced cable catching techniques using a one-inch thick rope strung between two towers. To safeguard against potential damage during docking maneuvers with the trailer, Ryan engineers equipped the X-13 with a replaceable wooden nose. On November 28, Girard accomplished the first ever transition from horizontal to vertical flight and vice versa in the X-13. Then on April 11, 1957, he launched from the trailer, seamlessly transitioning to conventional flight and executed a vertical landing, successfully fulfilling the X-13's mission profile. Illustrating the concept of dispersed operating sites, the second X-13 captivated over 3,000 military officers and journalists with an impressive display at the Pentagon on July 30, 1957. However, competing programs diverted funds away from the project, leading to the X-13's final flight on September 30, 1957. Despite later programs like the XV-6 Kestrel and the AV-8 Harrier achieving operational success, the X-13 provided an effective solution to the challenges of developing a VTOL fighter within the technological constraints of its era. The VertiJet successfully completed all designated tasks and undoubtedly excelled as an experimental demonstration aircraft despite the inherent impracticality of the operational concept. Ironically, by the close of the 20th century, the thrust vectoring system originally pioneered on the X-13 would evolve into an indispensable component of advanced combat aircraft. In 1960, Ryan generously donated the first X-13 along with its launch trailer to the Smithsonian Institution.
The B-2 Spirit takes the shape of a flying wing, serving as a strategic bomber. Its streamlined and efficient design makes it nearly undetectable by enemy radar. Despite being one of the most sophisticated weapons in America's arsenal, its journey to deployment was nearly jeopardized. Jack Northrup, an aviation legend, conceived the idea of the flying wing, turning his inspiration into an all-consuming obsession. When persistent design issues led the military to discard his prototype as scrap metal, Jack Northrup retired, deeply disheartened. Nevertheless, the vision of the flying wing that he passionately pursued persists. Featuring a striking black wedge shape spanning 172 feet from wingtip to wingtip, the B-2 Spirit resembles a futuristic bird of prey more than any other human-made object in the sky. It boasts an impressive payload capacity of 40,000 pounds, capable of carrying conventional or nuclear weapons to any target worldwide. Its unique ability to attack with pinpoint accuracy while maintaining near invisibility to enemy radar sets it apart. This revolutionary aircraft stands as the latest addition to a lineage of U.S. nuclear intercontinental bombers dating back to the Cold War's inception in the late 1940s. The B-36 Peacemaker, the initial and largest among these planes, was chosen for production over the direct predecessor of the B-2, the YB-49. The narrative of these two aircraft, one colossal and conventional, the other sleek and a flying wing, is steeped in competition, controversy, dreams, and disappointments, reflecting the vision of a pioneering aviator who envisioned the flying wing as the shape of the future. The visionary figure was none other than Jack Northrup. Jack Northrup firmly believed in the principle that if something is both efficient and beautiful, it is right. This philosophy infused a sense of velocity into every aircraft he designed. Commencing his career at Lockheed in 1919, Jack Northrup's passion for creating the perfect airplane led him through pivotal roles at Douglas, Boeing, and eventually his own company. His peers respected him and uh, considered him one of the design geniuses of American aviation. Donald Douglas mentioned that uh, there's a little bit of Jack Northrop in every American airplane that's been designed. When you walk around the United States Air Force Museum, you see the little influences of Northrop. You can actually see the imprint of the man's work. We have an A-17. And it, his name is just stamped all over this aircraft. It's a gorgeous airplane to begin with. And it shows a certain degree of sophistication that some of the other designers weren't quite there yet. One of Northrop's groundbreaking contributions to aircraft design was the introduction of the all-metal monocoque fuselage. This innovation eliminated the need for drag-inducing wing supports like struts and wires. We have in our collection uh, a Northrop Alpha. And it was the first uh, on a cock aircraft built by Northrop. It was very unique. It was used for carrying passengers like an airliner. And then later on when the, uh, what they call a CAB, CAA said that they, we needed a multi-engine aircraft for airliners. It was relegated to carrying the mail. All metal, uh, monocoque structured airplane, very well built. In the 1920s, Northrop Company played a pivotal role in designing the Spirit of St. Louis for Charles Lindbergh. Additionally, they crafted the first all metal low wing fighters for both the Navy and Army Air Corps. Northrop's influence extended to the design of the Lockheed Vega, a highly successful aircraft flown by aviation pioneers Wiley Post and Amelia Earhart in the 1930s. The profits from this venture fueled his ambition to pursue a project he had dreamed of since adolescence, the flying wing. The flying wing concept, ingrained in nature itself, is a timeless design observed in various forms, from birds and sea animals to wind-borne seeds. Some aviation pioneers of the early 20th century were inspired by these examples, designing flying machines that attempted to emulate the wing-like aerodynamic shapes they observed in the natural world. Jack Northrop's fascination with the shapes of nature was deeply rooted in his upbringing in Santa Barbara, California. Observing the graceful soaring of seagulls above the local beaches inspired him to delve into the study of flight. During this time, he began sketching airplane designs, predominantly centered around one large wing. Aligned with the ideas of his predecessors, Northrop envisioned that such an aircraft, characterized by a prominent wing, could be significantly lighter and more efficient than traditional designs. It's aerodynamically sounder. You don't need a stabilizer. You don't need a tail. You do not need a long fuselage, which all of these increase drag. More drag means you have to have more fuel to fly further distances. However, the early wing design encountered challenges related to control and stability. Undeterred, Jack Northrup remained enthralled by the potential advantages of the flying wing. 
From the outset of his career, he committed himself to addressing the drawbacks associated with wing-only designs. He worked for uh, Lockheed and Douglas before he founded his own company. And of course, at lunchtime, the engineers would get together and have a little bowl session. And they all kind of agreed that the flying wing was the ultimate design. After conducting experiments with the gliders, Northrop, in 1929, reached a milestone by testing a powered prototype of a flying wing. Due to the uncertainties surrounding the aerodynamic stability of a pure flying wing, this design incorporated some features reminiscent of a conventional aircraft. It did have twin tail booms with a conventional tail in the back. He was trying to get uh, the best lift coefficients on the wing roots and uh, airfoils, and uh, he learned a lot from that. In the fall of 1939, when Germany invaded Poland, Northrop formed his own company, Northrop Aircraft, and began producing new aircraft and bombers for the U.S. and its allies. Simultaneously, Jack Northrop embarked on drafting plans for an innovative flying wing, envisioning a design where all control surfaces, including the rudders, were integrated into the trailing edge. This revolutionary approach aimed to eliminate the traditional tail, resulting in a pure flying wing. By the summer of 1940, Jack Northrop and his design team initiated test flights for their groundbreaking prototype, the N1M, conducted on the deserted dry lake bed known as Maroc Army Airfield, just north of Los Angeles. Similar to Northrop's 1929 wing, the N1M prototype faced challenges. It uh, was very underpowered. When they uh, flew it out of uh, Hawthorne, they wanted to move it to Edwards, which was uh, Muroc at that time. They towed it over the hill and with a DC-3. Didn't have the power to get over the hills. What well, was the first successful wing? I don't know for what period of time they flew it, but it's now in the Smithsonian. Despite the installation of a more suitable engine, the aircraft underwent 200 test flights at Maroc. Throughout this period, Northrop tirelessly sought solutions to the inherent stability issues prevalent in tailless aircraft designs. The quest for an optimal solution to control the phenomenon known as yaw presented the most formidable challenge. Yaw is uh, your left and right, where the uh, airplane tends to yaw about its uh, vertical axis. On a conventional airplane, uh, this is controlled by rudder. On a winged vehicle, you have to have some device that creates drag at the wingtip to control or create yaw. In 1941, General Hap Arnold, the commander of the U.S. Army Air Corps, took the notice of Northrop's N1M. Arnold, actively searching for a new bomber capable of reaching Germany from the United States, recognized the strategic importance of such an aircraft. Although the United States had not yet declared war against Germany and Japan, the escalating concerns about Nazi Germany's successful air campaign against Britain raised the possibility of the Allies lacking secure air bases in Europe. In 1940, when it's obvious that the British were in serious trouble and they may fall, we're leaving just the United States to stand against Nazi Germany and the Axis powers, the Army Air Corps started looking for a super long-range bomber to be able to strike targets in Europe from the continental United States. The Army Air Corps issued a request for designs, specifically seeking a high-altitude bomber capable of carrying 10,000 pounds of bombs to its target and returning home, covering a total distance of 10,000 miles. Impressed by what he observed during a visit to Northrop at Maroc Field, General Hap Arnold, on November 22, 1941, signed a contract with Northrop to further develop his flying wing bomber, the N1M. It offered the possibility of ultra-long range. The flying wing was becoming more and more recognized as advanced. The aerodynamic aspects of it were quite evident, and the long range, because of the low drag induced by the aircraft itself, Plus, we had to start thinking very progressively. We couldn't think of just a regular aircraft to get across the continental United States or across the North Atlantic or anywhere in the world. Just two weeks later, on December 7, 1941, Japan bombed Pearl Harbor, propelling America into a global war. In this tumultuous period, Jack Northrop's dream of seeing the flying wing enter large-scale production seemed on the brink of realization. The surprise attack on Pearl Harbor prompted the United States to declare war against the Axis powers and injected a renewed sense of urgency into the development of Jack Northrop's flying wing super bomber, the B-35. To hasten the testing of the design, the Army allocated funds for the construction of experimental prototype versions, which were one-third the size of the B-35, reflecting the nation's determination to expedite the development of advanced aircraft during this critical time in history. 
Looking like something out of a Buck Rogers matinee, these aircraft, with the designation N9M, first took flight in December 1942. The fully restored N9MB, currently the sole flying example, occasionally graces the skies near its home at the Plains of Fame Museum in Chino, California. The wingspan of the B-35 was 179 feet. This is roughly 60 feet. So it's one-third scale, same airfoil, same sweep, same dihedral, just scaled one-third. The thrust center line of the two engines uh, replicates the uh, center line thrust of the four engines on the B-35, and the thrust to weight ratio is roughly the same. Among its numerous innovations, the Northrop N9M holds the distinction of being the first aircraft equipped with hydraulically boosted flight controls. The wing itself featured groundbreaking control surfaces, with Northrop ingeniously combining the functions of the aileron and elevator into a single component called an elevon. This is your primary pitch and roll control. That is, if they both go up and down, you get a pitch input, and if they're differential, you get a roll input, where you bank. Out here is the rudder, which is a drag device. It splits, it creates a drag on the wingtip. Normal airplane has a rudder at the back of the airplane, if you recall, on a fuselage for directional turns and so forth. So he had to basically invent how he would actually steer or fly the airplane. To address the absence of a traditional tail, the N9M's design incorporated elevons, creating a distinctive flying experience for its pilots. This uniqueness remains evident in today's aviation landscape. Flies very well once you get used to it. Not difficult, just uh, different. It's very meaningful uh, to fly this. Certainly it would be to anybody that, uh, that would have that opportunity. It's a very historic airplane, and uh, once you see it fly, you understand why. However, concurrently with Jack Northrup's endeavors in developing the Flying Wing Bomber, a formidable competitor was also taking shape, the Convair B-36. It was developed by a group of engineers, including Robert Widmer. I got involved with the B-36 uh, in order to run the first wind tunnel test, subsonic wind tunnel test which is to be run at MIT, and I was asked to run that program. The B-36 emerged in response to the same Army Air Corps requirement for a bomber with the 10,000-mile range and 10,000-pound payload. However, it stood in stark contrast to Jack Northrop's vision of beauty and efficiency embodied in the flying wing. In essence, the B-36 adopted a completely conventional design, diverging sharply from Northrop's aesthetic preferences. Its distinguishing feature was its sheer size, an unparalleled enormity in the history of aviation. The B-36 boasted a wingspan of 230 feet, surpassing the Wright Brothers' inaugural flight at Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, by over 100 feet. The aircraft was going to be so large, they had to save weight any way they could. So it meant using new tanks to hold new types of gases to use for fire extinguishers on the engine. Something as simple as that sounding takes a quite a bit of effort. You have to have new engines willing to pull this aircraft or push it, as it turns out, for two days, essentially, on a mission and not stop. This colossal aircraft overshadowed Northrop's B-35 design in every aspect, notably in the range and payload. Despite its impressive dimensions, the B-36 faced developmental challenges of its own. Consequently, the Army Air Corps chose to persist with Northrop's flying wing, recognizing its potential. In case one failed, the other was there. And when you're talking about national survival, having a second option, even if it's expensive, the treasure is, needs to be spent to save the blood of the Republic later. And that's what they were doing. So it gave a fallback option. As Jack Northrup continued refining his work on the B-35 bomber, he simultaneously delved deeper into exploring the possibilities and capabilities inherent in the flying wing concept. Northrup also designed several flying wing fighters. I'm thinking of the X. P-79B flying ram, powered by uh, twin Westinghouse turbojets. And uh, it was a rather unique aircraft, and unfortunately, uh, the war ended, they, they didn't do much with it. Northrop also built the MX-334 rocket wing fighter, America's first rocket-powered airplane, and the piston-powered XP-56 Black Bullet. 
Despite their promise, both the Flying Wing Bomber and the B-36 encountered substantial development issues and never transitioned into full-scale production. In 1944, as focus shifted towards the larger and more heavily payloaded B-36, the Army reconsidered the future of the B-35. Rather than pursuing its role as a heavy bomber, the Army envisioned the B-35 as a potential experimental medium-range bomber and reconnaissance aircraft. The urgency for such craft diminished with the non-occurrence of the potential crisis that had initially spurred the development of the Flying Wing Bomber and the B-36, the fall of Britain. The heavy bomber role within the U.S. Air Force was, in the meantime, fulfilled by a series of other aircraft such as the B-17 Flying Fortress, the B-24 Liberator, and the B-29 Super Fortress, none of which were connected to Jack Northrop. In August 1945, one of the war's concluding acts saw the B-29 named Enola Gay, piloted by Colonel Paul W. Tibbets, dropping the first atomic bomb on Hiroshima. Three days later, another B-29 targeted Nagasaki with a second atomic bomb. These events underscored the immense power wielded by bomber aircraft in the nuclear role. With the distant Soviet Union emerging as America's likely adversary in the post-war era, the urgent need for a new long-range heavy payload bomber became more apparent than ever. What the atomic bomb does for air power is for the first time, aviators can do what they say they can do. They can take out a strategic target because now they don't have to send a thousand planes across to do one job and go back. Now, one aircraft, one bomb can take out an entire industrial complex or an entire city that's necessary to do so. The geopolitical landscape and advent of nuclear capabilities elevated the importance of advanced bomber aircraft for strategic purposes. Partly for this reason, development efforts on Jack Northrop's B-35 as a potential long-range nuclear bomber continued. In June 1946, almost a year after the war's end, Northrop's B-35 finally took flight. Measuring an impressive 172 feet from wingtip to wingtip, the B-35 was equipped with four robust 12,000 horsepower piston engines, each driving a pair of counter-rotating pusher propellers. The aircraft's nine-man crew included three gunners responsible for defending the plane with 50 caliber machine guns and remotely controlled barbettes. Despite the aircraft's futuristic appearance, the wing design presented challenges for Jack Northrup. Jack Northrup had just a run of bad luck. The first aircraft crashed before he could draw the technical data that he needed from that aircraft, so he had to proceed with the second prototype. Without the necessary information that he would have garnered from the first one, it put the aircraft at a great disadvantage. While he had successfully overcome various design obstacles, finding a viable solution to the problem of yawing proved elusive. The B-35 also grappled with issues such as overheating engines and gear shift vibration. Faced with these challenges, Northrop decided to integrate a new technology into the wing, turbojets. By this time, turbojets had become the preferred propulsion method for all new military aircraft. Experimental versions of the wings were outfitted with eight turbojet engines, leading to its redesignation as the YB-49. The introduction of jet propulsion brought a transformative improvement in performance, swiftly resolving developmental problems like gear shaft vibration. Some test pilots even reported that the wings exhibited flight characteristics more reminiscent of a fighter than a traditional bomber, highlighting the positive impact of the shift to jet technology. At Northrop's suggestion, Test pilot Robert Cardenas demonstrated the wing speed by undertaking a cross-country flight. But, uh, an official speed record from Edwards all the way back to Andrews Air Force Base showed it off to President Truman, and Truman went through the airplane and saw it flying, and he thought we ought to buy some of these. The transition to larger jet engines on the YB-49 posed significant challenges, as it reduced the wing's bomb capability precisely when a much larger payload and range, akin to that of the B-36, were needed to transport the massive and heavy atomic bombs in use at the time all the way to the Soviet Union. Furthermore, Jack Northrop's wings still grappled with serious stability issues. On June 5, 1948, during a series of stall tests on the YB-49, Danny Forbes and Major Glenn Edwards were at the controls. The night before, Edwards had expressed optimism about the wing's progress, noting its impressive performance despite numerous test flights and extensive flying hours. However, he acknowledged that the stability remained a significant problem, adding, But the plane goes like hell. Tragically, during the tests that day, the pilot lost control of the aircraft, resulting in a crash and fire that claimed the lives of all five crew members. In honor of Major Glenn Edwards, 
The base at Moroc was renamed Edwards Air Force Base when the U.S. Air Force was officially established as a separate military branch. This renaming commemorated the sacrifice of those involved in advancing aviation and aeronautical innovation. Fearing that his beloved flying wing was doomed as a military project because of high-profile failures like the Glenn Edwards crash, Jack Northrop launched a publicity campaign promoting the flying wing as the airliner of tomorrow. Now a preview of the flying wing transport of tomorrow. The mid section provides ample room for 80 passengers. Spaciousness keynotes the luxurious main lounge extending 53 feet inside the wing. And future air travelers will really see something. Through the plexiglass windows of the front wing edge, passengers have an unimpaired view of the earth unrolling thousands of feet below. Coast to coast flights in four hours may not be too far away. Despite earnest efforts, no civilian air service expressed interest in the flying wing, leading to the U.S. Air Force's decision to cancel Northrop's contract in 1948. Instead, they opted to proceed with the Convair B-36. The cancellation of the flying wing project remains a contentious decision, with accusations of political bias favoring Convair mingling with the concerns about issues with the YB-49. Critics argued that political considerations played a role in the decision-making process, but undeniable were the significant stability problems inherent in the flying wing design. Many viewed the YB-49 as unstable both as a bombing platform and a long-range reconnaissance aircraft. It was understood by the Air Force at the time, even when they canceled the program, it had great potentials, but not quite now. Maybe someday in the future. For Jack Northrop, the most devastating blow came when the Air Force ordered the destruction of all existing flying wings, melting them down into aluminum ingots. It was devastating. Uh, to come in and see strangers come in and cut up your product right in front of your employees, it was really disheartening, of course. This experience deeply disturbed Northrop, prompting him to leave his company and take an early retirement, completely withdrawn from the aviation industry. In the race to be armed and ready for the Cold War, the B-36 emerged victorious over the flying wing. For the next decade, the B-36's colossal presence dominated the skies, serving as the backbone for America's nuclear arsenal. On December 7, 1948, exactly seven years after the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, a giant silver bird with six pusher-type props departed from Carswell Air Force Base, Texas. Over the Pacific, near Hawaii, it opened its bomb bay doors and dropped a payload of 10,000 pounds of dummy bombs into the ocean symbolizing the era of strategic air power during the Cold War. This airplane was the Convair B-36, and it had demonstrated, among other things, that it was a true intercontinental bomber capable of striking at almost any target in the world. The B-36 embarked on a long and challenging journey, marked by disappointments, delays, and intense controversy from its inception on the drawing board to its eventual operational status. It was a disaster. We needed to change the wing, and I knew we had to change the control surfaces. We had to put a different kind of fan on because it's a pusher engine to cool the things on the ground statically when it's not moving. The whole airplane had to be totally redesigned here, and, and we did that. One pivotal element in the final decision to proceed with the troubled project was the escalating tensions of the Cold War. Air Force Secretary Stuart Symington, recognizing the B-36 as the sole bomber capable of reaching targets inside the Soviet Union, played a crucial role in the program's continuation. The Strategic Air Command, or SAC, led by General Curtis LeMay, emerged as the primary custodian of U.S. nuclear weapons, and the B-36 became the cornerstone of U.S. Cold War strategy. It was the main part of Strategic Air Command. It was General Curtis E. LeMay's big stick. Uh, we flew everywhere, made lots of noise. Uh, of course, there was a big battle going on, whether it should get aircraft carriers or should get B-36s. And at that time, the B-36 won. The logistical challenge of finding a sufficiently large facility to assemble the colossal B-36 was formidable. Do you have floor space to build this monster? It's huge. You need a big hangar to put it in, to build it in. So where do you build it? You have to go to Fort Worth, where they just happen to have a large enough facility and it's all enclosed so people can't peek in the windows. The mile-long facility in Fort Worth, Texas, originally constructed for assembling B-24 bombers during World War II, stood as the only building on the planet spacious enough to accommodate the gigantic B-36. In the air, the B-36, often referred to as the Big Stick, 
boasted an extraordinary fuel capacity, enabling it to remain airborne for two days, far surpassing any other bomber in history. Additionally, it was the sole aircraft capable of carrying the exceptionally large and heavy nuclear weapons in the U.S. arsenal at the time. People often ask, why did the B-36 have to be so large? Well, it had to carry a lot of fuel to fly long range, but it also had to have a massive bomb bay to carry the large thermonuclear weapons like on either side of the bomb bay. These are massive monsters and it requires a massive bomb bay to carry them. With four bomb bays, each with a capacity of three freight cars, the B-36 could carry a maximum payload of 84,000 pounds, exceeding the gross weight of the B-29. The B-36 thus represented a formidable and unprecedented force during this critical period of Cold War military strategy. One of the biggest problems was building the frame to build the aircraft. They finally brought in a bridge builder, and he designed what we called a K-type frame that actually was a basic strength holding the fuselage together. Designing adequate landing gear for the 210-ton plane also posed unique problems. When it was first designed, the B-36 wheel was the largest aircraft tire in existence in the United States at the time. This had problems. First, the weight of the wheel itself. It could push through any concrete runway at the time, except for a very few within the United States. The planners came up with a four-wheel design, like on a B-36 that you'll see over here. This aircraft had four wheels first it lowers the risk if one tire goes out, the plane won't crash on takeoff or landing. Also, by spreading the weight out over four tires, it increased the number of runways that the B-36 could operate with. The original design of the B-36 featured six 28-cylinder, 4,360 cubic inch turbo supercharged radial engines, each rated at 3,500 horsepower. However, reaching the promised service ceiling of 40,000 feet posed a formidable challenge, and the top speed of the bomber barely reached 230 miles an hour. Critics raised concerns about the B-36's vulnerability to enemy fighters, particularly the new Soviet MiG-15. The slow-flying bomber was considered by some as a sitting duck, leading to accusations of being a billion-dollar boondoggle. In 1950, congressional hearings were held, sparkling a scandal known as the B-36 affair. Both Convair and the U.S. Air Force underwent an investigation. The controversy further intensified as part of the heated debate between the Air Force and the Navy over which service should control the U.S. nuclear mission in 1951. Efforts to address some of the B-36's issues led to modifications in the form of adding a pair of J-47 turbojet engines under each wing, employing the slogan, four burning and six turning. This modification significantly improved the Big Stick's performance, boosting its top speed to over 400 miles an hour and nearly doubling its rate of climb. With these enhancements, the modified B-36 could operate at higher altitudes than most fighters in the thin atmosphere at those elevations, offering an improved and more formidable version of the aircraft. Some F-100s challenged us, and uh, they were pretty braggadocio about how their airplanes can fly compared to this old hunk of metal here. Four of them came in on us into a sharp turn. The guys that turned with us all stalled out and went down a little bit and didn't get us. The B-36 featured retractable, remotely fired turrets with 20mm cannons located at the top, bottom, front, and rear of the aircraft, establishing it as the more heavily defended bomber in existence. We were quite well protected if we had fighters coming in on us. We could put a good screen of lead out there. A distinctive and unique feature of the B-36 was the pressurized tube light passageway, serving as a walkway to move between the front of the airplane and the crew compartment in the rear. The tube was an 80-foot tube from the forward pressurized compartment to the aft pressurized compartment, and it had a little cart like one of these carts you would lie on working underneath a car. And you would get in there and uh, grab a cable in there and then go to the aft compartment. There were doors on both ends so that if one compartment depressurized, you wouldn't be shot out like a cannon. Despite its ongoing controversy surrounding the giant bomber, the Convair B-36 effectively fulfilled its role as a deterrent to nuclear war from 1949 to 1959. At the very time when the American people are most nervous, all of a sudden you have this massive, huge, comforting aircraft that gives the American people a sense of security that they allowed us to think things through more clearly, come to rational decisions, so it's a security blanket for the American people, as well as a deterrent to the Soviets. 
In 1959, after a decade of service, the B-36 was replaced by the new jet-powered B-52 Stratofortress, another colossal conventional aircraft design. With Jack Northrup in retirement and no other flying wings in development, it seemed like the aeronautical world had moved beyond his dream. It would take nearly 30 years before an aircraft with a strangely familiar shape returned like a boomerang to replace the B-52, the B-2. During the test flights of Jack Northrop's Flying Wing Bomber, one of the surprising outcomes was the difficulty Air Force personnel encountered in trying to track the plane on radar, showcasing the aircraft's advanced stealth capabilities. The B-2, inheriting the legacy of the Flying Wing, would go on to redefine strategic bomber capabilities with its stealth technology. The most important reason for this was its shape. The elegance and economy of the wing's design meant that it had fewer surfaces to reflect a radar signal back to an enemy receiver than a conventional aircraft. The characteristics of the flying wing, particularly its difficulty to detect on radar, foreshadowed the development of stealth technology. The advantage of using a stealth technology is that you can use this one aircraft to fly in and you can deliver a precision-guided weapon at your leisure you don't have to worry nearly as much about enemy air defenses, they have to worry about you instead. The quest for stealth technology emerged almost immediately after the introduction of radar during World War II. As radar became a ubiquitous element of warfare, efforts were initiated to find ways to deceive it. Early attempts involved jamming German radar with clouds of tinfoil strips, codenamed Window, which proved highly successful. However, little progress was made in the realm of making aircraft themselves less detectable. The inadvertent success of the flying wing in evading radar detection laid the foundation for the deliberate incorporation of stealth technology in subsequent aircraft. The SR-71 and the B-1 bomber were among the first U.S. aircraft to purposefully integrate stealth technology, although it was still in its early stages of development. Interestingly, the advantages in stealth demonstrated by the flying wings seemed to be overlooked following the cancellation of the program. It wasn't until the 1970s, with the Soviet air defense network becoming more formidable, that research on stealth design gained renewed impetus. Operating in secrecy, designers developed several prototypes ultimately leading to the creation of the F-117 stealth fighter. Characterized by its heavily faceted shape, the F-117 reflects radar signals away from enemy receivers, making a significant leap forward in the evolution of stealth technology. The Flying Wing's early contributions to radar evasion became a critical foundation for the advancements that would follow in the realm of stealth aircraft design. But other scientists at Northrop Aircraft Working on an unrelated project in the early 1960s had determined that the ideal shape for a stealth plane was actually far different than the angular form of the F-117. We had a, a small group of what we called phenomenologists at the time. They were basically physicists and, and very bright young people with a wide open mind who became curious about uh, why is it that we can see things on radar? Is there a way of having a shaping that, that would make it difficult to see. They came up with these shapes and we were startled and pleased because lo and behold, the shape they came up with was exactly the shape of a flying wing. In the early 1970s, top secret development commenced on what would eventually become the B-2 flying wing stealth bomber, designed to serve as America's next generation nuclear transcontinental heavy bomber. Essentially, it needed to be, uh, number one, stealthy for future technologies and uh, future uh, enemy radar systems. It needed to have a large uh, payload capacity. Uh, thirdly, it uh, needed to be precise. Lastly, uh, it needed uh, long range, intercontinental. Similar to the challenges faced by the YB-49 and B-36, overcoming technological problems was just one aspect of the difficulties encountered during the development of the stealth bomber. Initiated during President Carter's administration, the B-2 project faced cancellation in the early days of President Reagan's first term, only to later be revived. Despite controversy, significant technical challenges, and substantial cost overruns, the development of the aircraft persisted. In the spring of 1980, an ailing and wheelchair-bound Jack Northrop visited the Northrop plant, where he was shown models for the future B-2 bomber. Notably, the B-2 was planned to have a wingspan of 172 feet, identical to Northrop's B-35 and YB-49. Touched by the experience, Northrop, who had less than a year to live, expressed, Now I know why God has kept me alive the last 25 years. 
Eight years later, on November 22, 1988, the first B-2 Spirit was unveiled at the Northrop Site 4 facility in Palmdale, California. During the event, as the doors opened, Northrop President and CEO Thomas Jones made a spontaneous announcement, marking a significant milestone in the realization of Jack Northrop's enduring vision. I was standing there and uh, obviously you get overcome by things and you see this beautiful airplane come out and you see this great crowd of people and so on and just said, Jack Northrop, we salute you, which we all felt for. The development of computer-assisted fly-by-wire flight controls, which were already being used by the F-117 and other advanced military aircraft, meant that the stability problems which had plagued Northrop's flying wing were no longer an issue in the stealth bomber. The yaw developed as an inherent trait with a flying wing. What allows us to solve that problem now is the flight control computers are so fast that they're able to make the flight controls move fast enough that it stops that yawing from occurring. Conventional airplanes, um, early on, you physically would pull on, on the control stick and it would move a series of cables and bellows and, and pulleys to make it all work. What fly-by-wire now does for us is allows the pilot to move the stick and now computers take care of all that mechanical control and it sends a computer signal out just like calling on a telephone. The aerodynamic efficiency inherent in Northrop's flying wing design paid dividends in the B-2 by allowing its engines to operate at lower power settings, contributing to a quieter operation of the aircraft. Notably, the grandson of the pilot who flew Enola Gay on the world's first nuclear mission is one of the pilots of these remarkable aircraft. When you look at it, you don't really see any engines. You see a couple of small intake holes on the front, a couple of small exhaust holes on the back, and that's about it. All of that works together to help reduce the signature and make the airplane more stealthy. Another key factor in the B-2 stealth compatibilities lies in the use of graphite composite material, which effectively absorbs radar energy. Maintaining a completely smooth surface on the airplane is also crucial in achieving optimal stealth characteristics. With this aircraft, you have to be more careful not to scratch the paint and the surfaces and flight control surfaces. If I bump this graph with a stand, I'm allowed to do anywhere from 30 to 40 hours worth of damage on a small scratch. With that paint missing, it's allowed to get the radar absorbed and possibly point your position out to who's ever trying to track it. These qualities collectively contribute to the B-2's remarkable success in the realm of stealth, providing it with the radar reflectivity equivalent to that of a basketball. Despite the challenges faced during its journey to production, the B-2 bomber had become the cornerstone of America's nuclear bomber force. However, its initial deployment in combat did not involve a centerpiece role in an atomic superpower showdown, but rather in a more conventional foreign conflict. In the early morning hours of March 24, 1999, two B-2 stealth bombers took off from their base at Whiteman Air Force Base, Missouri, marking a significant moment in the operational history of the B-2 in a more conventional military context. They crossed the North American continent, then the Atlantic, en route to targeted facilities in the former Yugoslavia. I was going into my first mission and I had stealthed up when the controller came back to me. He said, I've lost you on radar. And I tell you, that was just like a warm, fuzzy, reassuring feeling. Gave me a goose pimples like, hey, this actually does work. Approaching their targets with precision, the B-2 stealth bombers utilized their launch and leave capabilities during this crisis in Kosovo. Successfully deploying 32,000-pound satellite-guided smart bombs, these smart bombs were designed to land within 30 feet of their programmed coordinates, showcasing the B-2's accuracy in delivering payloads. When my weapons bay doors opened and the weapons started coming out, those 2,000-pounders coming out just shuttered the airplane. Thunk, thunk. That's when the reality of you know what we actually were doing really hit pretty hard. And we started to see uh, surface-to-air missiles being shot. It started just sinking in that, hey, this is for real. After dropping their bombs, the bombers returned to Whiteman Air Force Base approximately 31 hours after takeoff. Notably, the B-2s executed their missions in a manner that often left the enemy unaware of their presence overhead. A highlight of the stealth bomber's weaponry during the Kosovo crisis was the deployment of the Joint Direct Attack Munitions. JDAM transformed unguided bombs into highly precise weapons, contributing to the success of the B-2 in the 78-day air campaign. We strapped on a tail kit that has fins that move, and these GPS satellites, the Global Position of Six feeds it current information, updating it all the time all the way down until it strikes the target. Throughout the campaign, B-2 Spirits flew 49 missions, with all aircraft and their crews performing flawlessly, 
marking an impressive combat debut for the Flying Wing Stealth Bomber. 49 for 49 on-town takeoffs, uh, done with only six aircraft at the time. That's all we had here at, on this base. That's an amazing feat to be able to keep that ops tempo at such a high level. Uh, aircraft were talking to each other, coming and going from the targets. That's a unique concept of warfare that this nation or the world has never seen, where you have warriors taking off, going into combat and returning home after a 30 hour mission, walking home into the house and, and honey, what'd you do today? The 30 hour missions were exhausting, but the B-2 crew tried to find a way to stay occupied during the long flight. 15 hours on the way out are broken up by a couple of every feelings every four hours or so. And then you do your bombing and then you come back home, same thing. So what we try to do is maximize the amount of downtime to relax, to study our targets, anything we can to uh, keep our bodies as fresh as we can during the sortie. Despite the successes in Kosovo, the B-2's substantial cost had remained a focal point of controversy. Originally planned as a fleet of 132 stealth bombers, the program was scaled down significantly, resulting in a total force of only 21 B-2s. Nevertheless, the B-2 is a vital part of a trio of long-range multi-purpose bombers that also includes the B-1 and the venerable B-52. We've got uh, some weapons uh, upgrades coming along the line. We've just been certified with the uh, Joint Standoff Weapon starting into the cruise missile concept. Uh, so the B-2 could actually, if it has to, uh, fight its way into uh, a target area by launching cruise missiles and then delivering the JDAM, Joint Direct Attack Munition, uh, which is extremely accurate. With the B-2, you can go out, you can fly long distances, you can destroy targets within tens and sometimes ones of feet with precision weapons through any kind of weather that's out there. So if no one else can fly that night because the target area is socked in, it comes the mighty B-2 with its precision guided weapons that doesn't need any assistance, comes in, delivers its weapons and goes back home. That's why you need the B-2. With our stealth capability, it allows us to be first in and create holes in the defensive environment that the conventional airplanes can now use to strike effectively. Um, the B-2 is capable of getting in there first strike and uh, basically putting the lights out. The V-2 is definitely a long-term aircraft. The design is proven. The concept behind the design will last for a very long time. And its airframe, uh, again, is just a very simple design that is so effective. The B-2, proven in combat with its advanced stealth technology and versatility as both a nuclear deterrent and a multi-purpose bomber, is likely to remain a key element of the U.S. global military strategy for decades to come. When you see the B-2 fly over and give you that profile of the flying wing, it is a stylish aircraft. It just shows efficiency mixed with style. I think the legacy of Northrop is to point the way to the future so that engineers today and in the future can look at what this man did and can move forward and take the United States into new technological realms of aviation. However, despite the extraordinary success of the B-2, Jack Northrop's dream of fulfilling the skies with graceful flying wings has not yet been fully realized. Various challenges, including the expense and complexity of the computerized control systems needed for the flight stability, continue to impede the broader commercial acceptance of the flying wing concept. Nevertheless, as futuristic wing-like designs are once again being developed around the world, there is still a possibility that Jack Northrop's version of the flying wing, or something very much like it, could still represent the shape of things to come in aviation. Aviation, the art of aeronautics, began with the dreamers, inventors, and daredevils who dared to defy gravity. The journey of aviation was nurtured by pioneers like the Wright brothers, whose first flight marked a historic milestone. The role of aircrafts in world wars was groundbreaking, dramatically changing warfare strategies. This initiated a technological evolution in aviation, transforming the simplistic wings of a biplane into the thunderous roar of jet engines. Let's journey through the ages of aviation. 
Behind every great aircraft, there were great minds. These visionaries, like Sir Frank Whittle, the innovator of the turbojet engine, redefined air travel. Then there's Skunk Works' Kelly Johnson, the genius behind the SR-71 Blackbird. His designs combined speed, stealth and power, crafting machines that dominated the heavens. The contributions of these pioneers have left an indelible mark on the canvas of aviation, shaping the course of history and inspiring generations of engineers and aviators. Each epoch in aviation history gave birth to extraordinary aircrafts, each with their own unique features and roles. The Lockheed SR-71 Blackbird was a marvel of speed and stealth. The F-105 Thunder Chief, a supersonic fighter bomber, was vital in the Vietnam War. The P-51 Mustang, a long-range fighter, was critical in World War II. The P-47 Thunderbolt, a heavyweight fighter, was used extensively in the same war. The A-10 Thunderbolt II, the Warthog, is a close air support icon. The Messerschmitt Me-262 marked a leap forward in aviation technology. Each of these game changers were instrumental in their eras, and their legacies still resonate today. Beyond the game changers, there are those that have transcended their practical roles to become icons. The Concorde was not just an aircraft, it was a supersonic symbol of luxury and speed. The B-52 Stratofortress, a strategic bomber, is an icon of power and resilience. These magnificent machines and others like them have become much more than just aircrafts. They are enduring icons that encapsulate the audacious spirit, the relentless innovation and the boundless ambition that define the world of aviation. For more amazing aerial footage and to join us in this incredible journey, check out the Dronescapes YouTube channel. If you enjoyed this video, please remember to like and subscribe. And as always, thank you for watching.